The most important point to explain to you is what you are seeing with these dots is individual refugees. Each of these dots is an individual person. I think it's really important to make this point because it's all too easy to lose touch with the humanity, to the story. These are people, men, women, children, leaving their homes because of conflict and persecution with no alternative but to leave. These are people who, by definition, are losing their homes, losing their jobs. They're often divided from their families. They often face violence. They often face discrimination. Behind all of the rather beautiful pictures and dots that we're going to see here, please try not to forget the individual story and the individual suffering of the refugees that we are speaking about. Firstly, let's try to be clear with you about what we're seeing and what we are not seeing. What you are seeing is refugees as defined by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. These are people who are broadly fleeing conflict and persecution and crossing an international boundary. You're not seeing internal displacement. Much more internal displacement, in fact, than cross-border displacement around the world today. Large numbers of people, including in places like Syria, fleeing for their lives and not getting across international borders. We're not looking at that here. We're not looking at return. I don't think there's enough return. I think return is stalling for many refugees. But nevertheless, <coughs> refugees are returning around the world today. These data don't let us see that. And just one point of final clarification, we're not looking at migration. We're not looking at people who may be moving because of poverty people who are leaving because of food insecurity, people who are moving to work, large numbers of people doing that. This is not what we're looking at here. We're looking very specifically at a narrow category of people, which is refugees effectively fleeing for their lives and fleeing from their countries. The other thing to really explain to you what these dots are and the colours, yellow is people leaving their country, red is people arriving in another country. So you can see the flow by following the orange uh, and how it moves to red. And the interesting thing about Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire is it shows you how dynamic this process is. Initially, we have a, an exodus from Liberia into Cote d'Ivoire. A couple of years later, as political crisis uh, unfolds in Cote d'Ivoire, look, we have people from Cote d'Ivoire fleeing into Liberia. So this is a very fluid, dynamic process that we're looking at. We've chosen to focus on what is, of course, on many people's mind, which is Europe's so-called refugee crisis. And I want to use that word so-called because I think there's an argument that Europe hasn't faced a refugee crisis and I think we need to adopt some perspective. Firstly, clearly the epicentre is Syria and I think we all know that. So this, this is what we're focusing on when we discuss Europe's refugee crisis. Secondly, it's quite clear as you follow through the years, 2013, 14, 15, that yes, indeed, there have been substantial movements of refugees into Europe. We shouldn't deny it. In 2015, perhaps 1.5 million people arrived in Europe, especially in, in Germany and Sweden and various other countries across Western Europe. No one should deny that 1.5 million people is a significant number of people. It's an historic high of asylum seekers and refugees in the European continent. But please, let's get some perspective. This is 1.5 million people in a continent of 500 million people. This is 1.5 million people in the wealthiest single market on the face of the earth. This is 1.5 million people arriving in a continent that needs work, that has demographic gaps. This should be an opportunity and not the crisis that it seems to have been uh, portrayed and unfolded into. So I think perspective is really important. Another way to get perspective on this is to make the point, and I think these data show it very clearly, where are most Syrians going? They are not going to Germany and Sweden uh, and the various other European countries. They're in Turkey, they're in Jordan, they're in Lebanon. These are already poor countries. These are countries facing all sorts of crises, water crises and so on and so forth. These are countries that already have large refugee populations and here they are facing the brunt and bearing the brunt of the Syrian crisis. So please, when you think of Syria, don't just think of Europe, think about the neighboring countries. This is where the real crisis is. It's Jordan, Turkey, uh, Lebanon. We have become so obsessed with Europe and so obsessed with Syria that it's easy to forget that around the world there are plenty of other refugee crises unfolding. Uh, still, Afghanistan, Pakistan is an issue. Look at the Horn of Africa. Look at Central Africa. We tend to forget all of this and focus pretty myopically just on Syria and just on Europe. So I think putting this in perspective and getting a wider context uh, is really important. Look at the Mediterranean. In 2015, 4,000 people drowned trying to reach safety in Europe. I think that should give you a moment a, a pause for thought. It's absolutely astonishing what has happened uh, in the European context in the last couple of years. Between 2015 and 2016, the number of refugees arriving in Europe has decreased quite significantly. Around a million, perhaps more in 2015, down to around 300,000 in 2016. Why? Because of the EU-Turkey deal and because we built walls across the Balkans and across uh, Eastern Europe. Those walls have been effective in reducing the flows. What they've not been effective in doing is reducing the deaths. In 2015, 
a million arrivals in Europe and about 4,000 people joining in the Mediterranean. 2016, 300,000 arrivals in Europe, 5,000 people drowning in the Mediterranean. Europe's refugee policies have stemmed the flows, but they haven't stemmed the bloodshed. And we might want to come back to that discussion later. Please. <laughs> what you're looking at here is deaths around the world as a result of terrorism and violent extremism. Watch New York, 2001. Let's now, if we could, overlay the refugee uh, map. Now, we need to be immensely careful about causation, about correlation. It is quite clear that refugees are defined as people fleeing conflict and persecution. And I think let's be careful about making any sort of direct uh, causation or correlation argument about terrorism and violent extremism and refugees. But I do want to use this map to make one really important point. In many European countries today, and in the USA today, there is a feeling that by letting in refugees and asylum seekers, we are risking importing violent extremism and terrorism. I think this map makes it very clear indeed that there is a link between terrorism and refugees, and that link is that refugees are fleeing terrorism and violent extremism. They are not coming to our countries to perpetrate violent extremism, they are fleeing. There are risks in refugee camps. If you leave young men for 30 years in a refugee camp, don't be surprised. Some of them become angry or marginalized or disenfranchised and perhaps radicalized. There are links, we have to be careful about the links, but the links are not that these people are coming to our countries and societies to perpetrate violent extremism. I hope that map really illustrates that. Let's look to the future. What this map is showing you is what will happen to sea levels as the global temperature increases. So what you're looking at the bottom there is increases in temperature, one degree up to four degrees. Experts now think that by the end of this century, we should expect global temperatures to increase by two degrees. If it increases by two degrees, look at Bangladesh. It's disappearing under the sea with a fairly modest uh, rise in sea level, uh, responding to what most experts now think is a reasonable assumption that by the end of this century, we will have a two degree increase in global temperature. Climate change is taking place. There's still many questions about how fast it's taking place, where the impacts will be, but most experts now agree by the end of this century, a two degree increase in temperature would have this sort of impact on sea level rise. The question is, what are we going to do with people who inevitably will have to leave their homes in places like uh, Bangladesh? Now, let me be very clear, and the High Commissioner will certainly make this point, these people are not defined as refugees. The 1951 Convention clearly doesn't cover people fleeing as a result of the effects of climate change and environmental change. But there's no doubt at all that they will be in need of assistance and protection. Uh, and we need to find new uh, frameworks and new responses, and some are indeed developing, including at the High Commissioner's Office, to make sure that we can find ways to protect and assist people who will be leaving their homes as a result of the effects of climate change. Let's move away from the myth that climate change is going to flood Europe with millions of sub-Saharan Africans. It's not. What climate change will do is make more people internally displaced, make more people move locally, and yes, some of those people may move long distances to our sorts of countries. It's going to place a further burden on poor countries where already 80% of the world's refugees are. They're going to have to take more of those refugees and not fewer. And I think, again, we need to think of some global compact, global arrangement, whereby the North can really begin to share its responsibility for this unfolding refugee crisis. High Commissioner, please. We often speak these days about a global refugee crisis. You've heard this expression over and over again. It's also very much a series, a collection of local refugee crises. And as you can see, many of them are very localized. Also, the other characteristic that is clear from this uh, bigger map is that although we often think as this refugee crisis as a mass movement, a mass invasion even, of people going from the south of the world to the north of the world, in reality, most of the movements are south-south movements. So they go from one country, in many cases, very poor countries, to another country, which also has very little resources to deal with that particular aspect. And we need to invest resources in the countries with less means in order to, prevent, to respond and uh, uh, to uh, prevent. There are uh, a couple of uh, big uh, gaps which I think we should work in inserting. One is uh, the phenomenon, as was mentioned, of internally displaced people. Internally displaced people are, are like refugees that do not cross borders. In Syria, for example, Syria has 
um, you see produces this huge firework of people that you see in 2000 yeah this one so these are people leaving Syria in fact they just do not all leave from here they leave from all parts of the country and they go to neighboring countries and beyond these are refugees but Syria has a larger number of people that never make it to across the border and are stranded away from their homes inside Syria. We estimate that the refugees are about 5 million Syrians, and the ones displaced inside are anywhere between 6 and 7 million, or maybe more. And that is important to uh, capture. I don't know how. I, I'm certainly not an expert, because I think that that will give you a more complete uh, picture of displacement. We estimate that in 2015, the last year for which we have final, checked, verified data, 65 million were refugees or displaced, but two-thirds were displaced internally, and one-third was refugees. So you can see the proportion of people displaced inside is, uh, very, uh, is uh, very big. You see that at some point, the big flow ends in some of those uh, situations. The big flow stops. Now, it looks from this map like the problem is finished. In reality, the problem is not finished because the people are then there in the country where they fled to uh, and uh, they have to be taken care of. Although they are not anymore a colored dot on this map, they are a dot, a static dot in the country where they have arrived. This is the, one of the biggest problems that we have seen in the last decade. As we become, as I always say, less and less capable, less and less smart in solving conflicts, uh, refugees that flee from those conflicts stay in exile for longer and longer periods. And the challenges of a long exile are different from those of emergencies. Remember, emergencies in the end you find resources to respond, especially those that are high profile. Protracted situation after four or five years, you don't find resources that easily. There is a fatigue that kicks in and the needs that uh, protracted exiles um, uh, produce like education for children, employment, self-reliance uh, for all of the refugees are the most difficult to meet with the humanitarian resources that we work with. This is why we've, you know, the big Euro crisis was an eye-opener uh, on, on, on this phenomena, and there is an increasing awareness that we need to respond to refugee movements in different ways. So how do we involve, for example, international financial institutions, the World Bank, uh, the regional, uh, 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 regional development banks with their longer term resources, bigger resources and investments that are of benefit to the refugees and the communities that host them. How do we involve the private sector that has a lot to uh, contribute, not just by way of resources, but through approaches that we need to develop to make assistance more effective. What is not shown here, Khaled said it, is the return. We should not forget that people do return home. There is this perception that refugees want to go away to have a better life. They usually want to go away, as was said, because they're afraid of insecurity and, uh, and, uh, uh, um, and violence. But most of the refugees, the overwhelming majority, want to go back to their homes. That's why there's so many displaced people, because this internal displacement is closer to home than, uh, than uh, being a refugee across borders. Most people chose, choose to go to a safer place near their, their city, near their town or their village. And they want to return home. Now, you would see that if, you, uh, if we had a return map, it would be very interesting. Because in the 90s, when uh, conflict resolution was more dynamic, in a more monopolar world with the US very engaged, many conflicts were solved, many people went back home. And progressively this has dried up. We see much less, re many less returns right now. And yet we see some, we see some. Whatever happens in Syria could open up the possibility of some return. And I think it's, it would be useful to, s 
to show it because my personal battle inside my organization and in the communities in which I work is let's not forget that we, much as we have an emergency relief reflex, a protection reflex, this is what we need to do for refugees, we need to continue to have that solutions reflex. I look forward to developing new visuals to show also that movement, hoping that in the next few years we will see those perhaps blue dots multiplying on this map. Thank you very much.